this now? Because mm. this is this is this is funny conversation that could uh, could be shared. No, Compaq was a very large personal computer company, and uh, and they made some of the best personal computers during the Windows three point one age. This is how old I am. Uh, so, so if you if you, if you guys Google Compaq, the original. Computers look like sewing machines. Um, they were portable, amazingly. Like it was mind blowing for us back in the day. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the relativity of all that. But uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wait well, one minute. One, one more. One more minute. One, 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 as uh, as folks continue to show up. Sure. But, sure. Uh, okay. So what, you know what? Here's the full circle thing. Like, uh, and we'll talk more about technology as I talk, but. A lot of the concepts that were on there run the IBM architecture. And if the if, the, if you Google SNA architecture, okay, mainframes predated obviously. Uh, I mean, in terms of commercial use, predated today's modern internet, right? I mean, I, I worked on some kind of crude versions when I was a graduate student. Uh, uh, pre predecessors to internet. It's a long story, um, but uh, the architecture's gone full circle. <laughs> Because how we treated things in the mainframe is basically similar to how we treat things with cloud architectures today. But it is oh, funny that the same concepts are, are basically back around, right? Um, that's really interesting. I did not know that. That's yeah, a, yeah. That's really so, interesting. People. So, so things come and go, right? They, they. Uh, in fact, you can recycle most of the concepts. Everyone thinks are new are actually recycled over and over. Uh, you'll find it in the, in the annals of computer science. A lot of this stuff is around and around. And you find it in every... I mean, as an engineer too, I, I look at mechanical engineering, a lot of me classic mechanical devices, car-based things, automotive aircraft. A lot of that stuff was done like in 1870. All right, so yeah, there we I go. think uh, we're at 4.30. I'm gonna introduce our speaker and then I'm going to get the floor open to, the, uh, to our first guest lecture. So Evan, you have the... I don't know what this is called, privilege or whatever, to be our very first guest lecture. So you don't have to. Uh, we uh, we we had all the technical difficulty last time, and hopefully this is sorted out. I it's at we're at two hundred ninety four students right now. I'm getting just king bit bit nervous. Once they hit past three hundred, I'll be like, okay, Zoom has not it's not going to fail me this time. So let's see. Uh, so Evan Evan, who is a uh, a serial entrepreneur entrepreneur, very successful one in the field of computing, medical technology, music, and I'm sure I'm missing something that he's going to talk I, about. And I, I, I say the, the music thing because uh, he had a music label who happened to own the rights to Taylor Swift before uh, Universal. So I found that out during uh, lunch one day and I was say, well, I'm going to tell my students about this next time I'm inviting Evan. Uh, he also happened to be one of the rare uh, industry folks that we have that have a uh, teaching experience at university level. So he taught at uh, uh, entrepreneurship at Mount Royal University. Most of his uh, career is about is really around the field of computing, which uh, which Evan would tell you more about. Uh, <clears throat> more than all of that, Evan's a friend. He's a collaborator. We've known each other for three, four years now. He's been a mentor to me. And uh, honestly, of all the people in my circle, in my network, he's to me the best person to answer the question, how to have a successful career in computing and really how to have a good life if, as a computer scientist, right? And uh, Evan is a... <clears throat> Evan's the talker, and uh, he likes to talk a lot, and he likes to answer questions. And he has uh, already told me that he's open to any questions from the left field if you have, right? So after he gives his talk, uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, what I will say, how this is going to work from now on, is I will be the host and uh, the guest lecturer, in this case, Evan is going to share their perspective. And I will be the one to try to write down questions from the chat and pick them to ask Evan. It's just because we have now 331. Yay, I'm very happy, right? And, uh, and 300, so, so we're past that 300 limit, so I, we're okay now. Um, but so uh, 
So I will try to capture the questions, synthesize them and ask Evan, just because we have more than 300 people. It, it be, I don't want Evan to look at chat. So I would say, Evan, you don't have to look at chat, just share your screen and, uh, and talk. And if there's something really urgent, I will interrupt with, uh, uh, with, with voice. Okay. So over to you. Okay. Thanks, Kai. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, 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 I'm fine with, uh, you don't have to softball any questions and I'll try to answer as best I can. I'm, uh, I'm not being paid by York. So I am not under any contract because so I can say wherever I want uh, within reason, I think. <laughs> so, um, so I, I did a little presentation. So I thought, you know what, I would start a little bit about me because everyone always wonders, right? And a little bit of my story. And uh, um, like I said, Kai said, just ask the questions as we go through it. Um, and I'm hoping to give you some nuggets out of this thing. Obviously, in one hour, it's going to be I can compress my entire life and my knowledge into one hour, but I'll, I'll do my best to give you some of the highlights. So I'm, I'm, I'm based out of Calgary, uh, Alberta, but uh, so if you can Google me, I'm fairly out there. Uh, I'm divorced and remarried. I have a wife, Jane, and four sons. Uh, two of them are in tech. Uh, all my sons had declared they did not want to have anything to do with tech because dad was in tech and hmm, they somehow got sucked into the vortex. I had the last laugh. Um, three live in the GTA region. Um, I have a brother, a couple of nieces, some very close friends and a, and a huge community, which we'll get to. Um, so I think it's an important part of my life is, is family and friends first. So um, so I I, uh, I like to talk about origin stories and uh, not like the Marvel Universe or anything like that. But we all have origin stories. And I think everyone has a different story. And that's what I start off with. Right. Um, and, and, and everyone's story. Um, I think, you know, we we are so swashed in social media and people basically, you know, whitewashing their histories and curating and mostly BS. Uh, the real stories are actually much more interesting and more mundane, to be honest, and so is mine, right? So there's nothing, nothing at all extraordinary about my early life. Uh, I was born, born in Kingston, Ontario. My parents were uh, immigrant students. Uh, it's a long story, basically political refugees um from uh, communism and then nationalist government in taiwan which is another whole story anyways we uh because of that we we moved around a fair bit so uh, i've lived in kingston saskatoon winnipeg and toronto all before grade 13 and uh finishing up in ontario and toronto and lots of schools so uh i wouldn't say my life was disrupted a lot but it wasn't exactly you know i stayed in one place had the same gang of friends it got disrupted a fair bit um and back in the 1960s and 70s, Canada was, uh, I would say, a very white country. <laughs> was that? Um, I'm just going to put that out there. So people of color weren't very common. And certainly uh, uh, racism, discrimination were real challenges. But, you know, um, I, uh, I managed to persevere through that. And uh, it's kind of like one of those classic things where uh, there are more great people in Canada uh, and supportive people than there were the really i'm just going to say shitty human beings uh, which we still have with us but nevertheless that was part of my uh, my upbringing which I, I won't get into too much today but um, i'm happy to field questions on that um academically everyone wonders uh i was totally unextraordinary i was basically a b student um much to my parents disappointment and those of you that have uh uh you know eastern asian parents or even southeast asian parents my condolences uh, I grew up with that social pressure. What's wrong with you? Why don't you have straight A's? But to be honest, my mother and my father didn't have the heart to push me that hard. My father had kind of given up on me going, I had more or less the conversation. Nah, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed academically. My father got that. Um, but I had lots of interests and I had friends and and uh, I, I read, I watched film. I had Friends, I made eight millimeter movies. We, I was in a garage band. I took apart cars and I played a ton of sports. Um, so my father knew one thing and I, I quote him, he's, my father's passed on, but uh, these crazy white people really like sports. <laughs> so he knew that for me to fit in, I should play sports. So I played a lot of soccer, football, and hockey when I was a kid, uh, much to my mother's chagrin because she thought I was gonna get killed. Um, so 
I almost had a lot of part-time jobs. We didn't have a ton of money. I wouldn't say we were poor. I think by today's standards, we lived by below poverty level at the beginning of our my childhood, but uh, I didn't think we were poor, but you know, I was a line cook. I got all kinds of burns on my arms from the hot grill. Uh, I was a bike mechanic. I was a reservist for a while, uh, and actually in, in an infantry unit here in Toronto. Uh, was it to my liking? I spent a year in that. I said, well, I don't think the military is my thing. Um, so that's my background. Um, so this gets interesting now to our talk today. So I had literally a professional random walk. In other words, I didn't have a plan. Um, I, uh, like I was a B student, I couldn't get into the top universities for engineering, which I thought that that's what I wanted to do. I really didn't know what an engineer did, to be honest. Um, other than what I thought they did was design cars and airplanes and stuff like that and bridges. And uh, as uh, uh, <laughs> soon discovered, you don't do a whole lot in Canada. Um, so uh, I ended up at University of Alberta, which was one of the better schools that I could get into because my marks weren't good enough to, you know, go some of the tops at the time, the top schools. Um, and when I fell into it, uh, I think some of you might have heard me talking about how, how terrible I am at math at, at, at a relative level. Um, and then I discovered, oh my God, engineering's full of math. <laughs> it's like, what? Um, I really struggled. I almost flunked out in second year, but uh, I was already all in and paid the tuitions. Uh, yeah, I'd been burning up what savings my family had put aside for me. So I said, I got to finish this thing. Uh, but I did get lucky because uh, uh, University of Alberta had a co-op program and I ended up working at a, a variety of companies. And this feeds into my theme and, and uh, you know, Edmonton Telephones, which eventually became TELUS, the big, the big uh, telco. Uh, Nortel, which was Canada's greatest sort of industrial company until they went bankrupt uh, in the early 2000s under basically corporate mismanagement. Um, an outfit called Coal Mining Research. I was busy out there in the field chipping off coal samples. Uh, so I was part of, and then uh, CIL, which is a large petrochemical company. So I did a swath of stuff. Um, but uh, I want to put some context. Um, so back then, 1980s, uh, there was a lot of economic instability in Canada, which I, I think is germane because you guys are facing something similar but different. So if you can believe it, look it up. Prime interest rate back then, if you can believe this, was 19%. 19% interest. Um, unemployment was 13%. Youth unemployment, of course, was worth, uh, much worse. And then our population was way smaller. I mean, GTA... I tell you, when I went to high school here, uh, basically GTA ended at Steeles Avenue. I lived up in North York. I could ride my bike out my back door, go up uh, 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 Bayview Avenue, get across Steeles and was farmer's fields. Highway 7, 407 didn't exist. It was uh, Highway 7 was a two-lane highway, one lane in each direction, right? So there was a big difference. And now that look, you guys are computer science ones, you'll find this hilarious because we're talking about mainframes. It's, one gig of storage memory, not even RAM, but 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 uh, magnetic storage was 300,000 USD. 300,000 USD. Um, so right now it's like 0 0.00 of a dollar. So you know, we're talking basically memories free. Um, so what actually galvanized me in university, actually I saw my first IBM PC uh, at university in, in, in our engineering faculty. And I glommed right onto that damn thing because it was a lot of money back then. It was it was uh, 1,600 USD. So basically 5,000, no, it's actually 6,000 Canadian today uh, for a basic machine that had literally nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so uh, I, uh, I got through university and then I graduated to a brutal economy in Alberta. Alberta was in, the, in, a, in a massive slump. I got a contract with a petroleum company and it was only because of my computer skills, <laughs> and my very weak computer skills in those days. I'd taken programming as an engineer and most engineers ignored it by the way, but, but uh, I, I, I loved uh, programming. And, and so I wrote them a little tiny um, spreadsheet program with something called macros <laughs> to do this calculation. And, Unfortunately, the uh, project I was working on didn't get financed. They were junior oil. And I learned a little bit about financing back then about, oh, ooh, people have to raise capital. Oh, they got to get investors. They got to convince investors and all this. I was actually in meetings and I got lucky. I sat in the meetings in the corner because I could run the spreadsheets. 
Anyways, they, as soon as after they hired me, they laid me off and a bunch of other young engineers and we we're back on the street. But I already knew what was up because I did the spreadsheet. And I said, these calculations are looking pretty weak. And uh, so I had applied back to University of Alberta to do a master's in something called engineering management. And I knew one of my professors wanted a grad student that could actually program. So I did that master's. And, and, and interestingly enough, I got lucky and it was pure fluke. Uh, the work I was doing basically was the fundamental science of supply chain management, which wasn't a business yet. It wasn't a field of interest. I was looking at things like queuing theory and uh, traveling salesman problems and you know, optimization of, 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 of solutions. So uh, while I was in, in, in doing my master's, though, of course, as a graduate student, I had you know, plenty of time to work on other things. So I got a part-time job at an engineering firm. Uh, which my professor, my my advisor knew the, the the vice president there was a engineering firm, so I worked there while I was trying to finish my master's and end up I ran out of money, so I needed to work full time. And uh, so, long story short, it, I went through a crazy time there too because I was one of the plant engineers, and uh, the company went bankrupt. I actually, showed up at work, the doors were padlocked. Um, this is a place that employed four hundred people, right? And there was a big notice back in the day. There's no email or anything. So it was a notice literally uh, taped with duct tape to the door saying that there will be a meeting, uh, you know, this time show up. Um, the company's, you know, been in receivership. The, its loan has been pulled by the bank, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what receivership meant. I was an engineer. I didn't take business classes a whole lot, which I should have. Um, make long story short, that became my opportunity. They uh, interviewed a bunch of us. And in receivership, I learned that the receivers have two choices. They can either liquidate the firm, in other words, shut it down, sell all its assets, trying to recover as much money back for its creditors, or operate the company and sell it as a going concern. So I learned that operating as a going concern was much more valuable to the, to the, uh, the debtors. In other words, a company is worth more alive than dead 10 times. And those receivers were really good business managers as opposed to the previous managers and owners of the company, which they crashed in the ground with, were okay, but were mainly sort of amateurs. These guys were professional business managers. And I learned a lot, which I'm going to talk about, is they understood that the soft stuff was the hard stuff. In other words, the soft skills were what was important. I watched them then renegotiate with a whole bunch of other companies, creditors, employees, figure out who actually did the real work in the company. And crazy enough, you know, at age 25, I was made the plant manager interim. I had to stare down 200 boilermakers every day, unionized boilermakers, because I did the schedules. It was just pure fluke. Anyways, I did that for a year and it was okay because I had enough emotional intelligence <laughs> to know that I knew shit. There was no way I could throw my weight around. And I worked with the uh, the plant manager, who was an old Welshman. Um, and uh, we did a good job and uh, we got the plant going again. And I Again, I, I worked like literally 60 hours a week because I needed my job and this plant needed to stay up. And I mean, me and some other younger engineers, we it was probably one of the best years of my life. But the new owners uh, came in and bought the place and fired us all, put their own management team in, essentially. Um, so I joined ESSO Resources in Calgary. Um, again, not because I was an engineer, but because I was an engineer that actually had computing skills. And they fired me off to Cold Lake to work in this crazy thing called oil sands back in the day, or heavy oil or tar sands, whatever you want to call it today. And, and I actually worked on the management uh, systems, implemented them into their company. Again, they didn't have many guys who knew the engineering side and computing science. So, And then I worked on other projects, something called Oslo, which was a huge oil sands project. And then I worked for Imperial Oil, which was a division. They were all part of a family of companies in, in Toronto. And then that's where I got my idea um, to do a startup, a software startup. Um, so that's the quick run through of that. Um, so I want to talk about something, what happened here. So that was over a period of about seven years, uh, uh, six, seven years of working, but, you know, from age 19 through, uh, 31. Uh, so about a decade, uh, I call it my accidental base work to be an entrepreneur. Um, and one thing you'll discover if you actually do sort of literature searches that, you know, the, the sort of the public perception is that tech founders are all like 22 years old and 25 year old billionaires and blah, blah, blah. And 
what you discover is, yeah, that's what the ones they publicize. The vast majority of people that are successful tech founders and entrepreneurs are generally in their late 30s, early 40s, uh, even in their 50s, right? Um, and it's pretty obvious why once you start doing this, they have accumulated knowledge, skills, and networks. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So the two things of accidental base work, I'll talk about specifically, though, that I thought was important. Because at the time, I didn't think I was going anywhere. You kind of see I was kind of up and down in jobs and so this way. So there's actually no real pattern. I didn't have a proper career progression, as people would say. Um, and I, I learned that that's also a myth. The vast majority of people, there is no sort of planned progression, right? It, it happens to be a combination of circumstance um, and, and uh, you know, black swan events and a whole bunch of other stuff. So now, uh, saying all that, that kind of weakness in my career planning, so to speak, came and became my strength, right? Because all that variety of work I learned later when I was starting to teach entrepreneurship was actually I was doing the five discovery skills that uh, distinguish innovative entrepreneurs from other executives. So this was done at uh, Stanford University and, and a few others. Uh, Clayton Christensen is one of them. And if you look up Clayton Christensen, which I recommend you do. He's the father of um, the, the theory of uh, disruptive innovation, which pretty well all of Silicon Valley follows that line of thinking around creative dis, uh, creative disruption. Nevertheless, they were looking for what made what distinguished in a very longitudinal study. I think three thousand executives they looked at, and they discovered they had five skills that really separated them. The rest of the background is all noise. In other words, some had engineering degrees, some had economics degrees, some had no degrees, some were lawyers. You know, they came from every social economic um, place. You know, there was a little bit of um, a head start for a lot of them. I mean, they had some, uh, you know, some of them came from better socioeconomic backgrounds. And we're starting to see more and more of that now, but that's a different, different topic. But the thing that really separated them, regardless of how they got there, was this five skills. And it was questioning things around you. It was observing, right, with, with an open mind. It was taking a lot of experiments, and it was networking. And guess what? I was forced to do all of those things. Every time I found a new position, I had to figure shit out really fast. So I had to watch people, question all the time, figure out what's going on. I didn't have time. I didn't have the courses. I didn't have the training. I experimented all the time and kind of quietly buried all the experimental mistakes that died. Uh, but most importantly, I built up a huge network of people that I knew because I kept them moving around, but I kept in touch with people. And if I had a problem, I would call them up and ask them, hey, I got this issue. I don't know what to do. You, you got any background or, you know, someone they go, I don't know. But uh, I went to school with someone who was working on this. I'll, you know, here's your phone number. This is pre-internet. No, no emails, no texts. You had to phone people. Um, the important thing that's really important is the sleeper thing is that um, there's this concept called associational thinking, um, and uh, there's a there's a there's an interesting researcher, uh, Chicken Mahiley, which wrote the book Flow, talks about flow state. But associational thinking is you always wonder where good ideas come from, and of course you realize that good ideas come from nowhere. Basically, they appear to because you know that classic thing. If you sit there and try to say to yourself, "I'm going to write," you know, the best a big pop, hit pop song. And you talk to any composer, and I've had the good fortune to talk to a lot of composers over the years and stuff, pop right, pop artists, and that's another part of my story. I'll tell you in the next piece. They'll tell you, you, you just can't sit there and say, I'm going to write a top hit. I'm going to sit here and do it. And this is how a top. Yeah, there's a few producers and stuff that are formulas and all that, but even they'll say that it tends to be more capturing lightning in a bottle. And where it really comes from is something called associational thinking. In other words, you do all these things like questioning, observing, experimenting, network. You're building a base for yourself. And from that base, your brain does some magical stuff and it, the thing just pops. You know, it's that classic thing. If you're working in a problem, you're super frustrated and you're going nowhere, you should go take a walk, take a shower, take a nap, do something else. And all of a sudden, when you're not thinking about it, guess what happens? The answer shows itself. It's just one of those mysteries of human cognition. So I was basically doing base work. I was collecting all this. I, it was all this sort of an asset, which I wasn't applying just yet. So um, so that was one thing that was going on. The other thing, too, is I discovered that uh, this model of uh, human beings and how they behaved, because I was watching people. And, um, you know, uh, I went to a lot 
I went to university with, you know, 100 graduates that I kept in touch with maybe 20 of the 100 students. And I saw the, us fall into two camps, the ones that were intrinsically motivated. In other words, we came from what this model here is called a self-determination model, autonomy, which is a direct a desire to direct our own lives. In other words, I want to be independent. Mastery, which is that desire to be good at something. I, I'm proud of having these skills. I, I like to code. I, I love the craft. I like the good code I create. And purpose, which is doing something bigger than yourself. I like more than anything is building something with a bunch of people that I really like working with. And it was really cool when it happened. And that's all intrinsic. That's inside your body, inside your head, inside your heart. Though a lot of my friends went the other way and were extrinsically motivated, which is carrots, basically chasing bonuses, big salaries. And in Alberta was when the economy started to recover, the oil and gas business, um, most of you guys probably don't know, paid incredibly well, incredibly well. So back in the 18, uh, in, back in like the 1980s and 1990s, as an engineer or a computer science graduate or a business grad, you were probably paid 30 to 50% more base salary and bonus than uh, other industries for doing the same work. So people chase that money. And um, what I discovered was uh, I didn't like the work. Uh, I found the work basically not interesting at all. So I had no interest to go back and I, I because I had I'd been adjacent working in those companies in oil and gas and I didn't find the work interesting. I didn't like the culture, which is a whole other story. Um, very, very, um, I'll just say it, it was 1980s, 90s. It was racist, misogynist, homophobic. It was just not a great place to be in my opinion. Um, a lot of people love it and they'll tell you it was the greatest thing. And you can take one look at them and you'll know why, because they're not one of the other groups. Um, so <laughs> it didn't it matter how much you paid me. I didn't want anything to do, do with it. But what I discovered was my friends that got onto that, um, they changed. Um, and they, uh, their creativity disappeared. They basically were chasing a buck and there were never enough bucks. It didn't matter whether they were making a hundred thousand a year, 200,000 a year, half a million, some of my friends were starting to make back in the 1990s, half a million a year, if you could believe it, only six, seven years out of school. Today's ought to be a million a year. That's serious cash. But you know what? I, I can tell you many years later now, I, I don't think it's worked out that well for many of them. That's something else we can talk about. So, um, so that's the two things I learned. I switched out of that decade and started my first company, Kalami Logic. And uh, <laughs> I... Um, <clears throat> I had a colleague at work who was like eight years my senior, and he jumped out of ESSO to start this company. And you got to understand something. In the 1990s, no one did startups, not in Canada. And if you did a startup, people were just more looking at you like, oh, you didn't start do a startup. You got fired and you got nothing else but to do but start your own company because no one wants to hire you. It was kind of the attitude. And um, but he had this really interesting idea, and I chickened out actually. I uh, went, oh man, I'm you know, Esso's paying me pretty well here. Um, I uh, I had a uh, uh, I was living with my my uh, girlfriend at the time, who was my became my first wife. We divorced a few years later, but anyway, it's another story. Um, life was getting actually comfortable for me for the first time, right? I had cash on the side, I could take a few vacations, I bought a new car you know, the Canadian dream. Um, then ESSO hit a wall. All of a sudden, you know, the oil patch slowed down again and there were no promotions for anybody. And I looked up the ladder and looked up at all these uh, baby boomers ahead of me and said, the, the ladder is full of other people that I can't get past. So I left and joined my partner, Rod, and we started Army Logic, which was a ERP software firm. Uh, without getting the long story over a period of uh, six, seven years, we built it up. You know, we, uh, we eventually had 100 million in revenue and 500 employees. I was the co-CEO. Uh, we were acquired by PricewaterhouseCoopers and I became a partner there for a few years, but it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't my thing to be a big partner. I didn't enjoy the bureaucracy and stuff. So in the meantime, I've been fooling around with some other friends. It was another part of my theme. I always have something going. Um, we're building something stupid called an e-commerce server, which no one fully understood. Basically, it's a, it's a shopping site. Back in 1998, um, this guy's basically kitchen counter. Um, and I was just doing it because it was, it was kind of interesting. I was kind of curious about the technology set. And um, 
uh, we uh, we threw a party for our staff at Omni Logic, and we hired a band called the Sky Diggers, which was a pretty popular Canadian roots rock band back in the day. Um, and after the show, you know, we're, we're, uh, there was an after party and I was hanging around with them and uh, I was talking to the founder of the band, Andy Mays and his brother, uh, who's his manager. And they were talking about, they were actually you know, basically crying into their beers because they'd lost their record label um, uh, deal. They had a three classic three la record label deal and the third album had bombed and they were done. And they're going, oh man, I got to go get a real job kind of a thing. And, you know, they love doing music and we, we started asking questions. So back to the questioning part I talked about, people love to talk and I, I'm not starstruck. I'm not uh, what they call a jock sniffer. I don't like hanging around celebrities. I don't think of celebrities. And these guys would have been celebrities back in the day, so to speak, if you were into that kind of music. So I just started asking them questions. And so did my business partner, Mike, um, you know, how does this work? Because I didn't understand record deals really. I mean, I kind of knew as a layperson. So once we started rooting around, we went, wow, this is a really screwed up industry. And so naively, we started Maple Music up, um, which became at one point in time, Canada's largest independent label record. Um, the story's not that great though, because as like all things on the inside, it was mass chaos. We were always fighting with the big labels. Um, the big labels uh, were being recorded. Eh? I'm not going to say anything that bad about them. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> they have big legal teams. Smart. Anyways, what was that? <laughs> Smart. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, they didn't like us. And we actually, we were actually building a streaming service back in the early 2000s and Oh, you wouldn't believe all the resistance I got. People literally believe that CD, CDs, which you kids don't even know what they are probably. Uh, MP3 music file format had just sort of come out a few years before. There's something, this thing called uh, torrenting, which I knew about, but they didn't know about because we were starting to move big files around back in the day when the internet broadband wasn't very good. Lol and all that stuff. We were trying to do that, but they were selling a lot of, um, product as CDs, physical CDs, and they didn't see the streaming thing coming at all. So anyways, Maple got crippled by a whole bunch of deals. I still have shares in the crazy thing. I can't get my money out, which is another downside of being a tech entrepreneur. So it's easy to start these things. It's hard to get money out of them. Not that I, um, I did it for money, but it's you know 20 plus years later, and I still have my shares in there. And yes, we did have Taylor Swift. It was a long story. We acquired her in a deal, um, but the deal had a cap on it. So um, once she hit a certain volume of business, she, we had to revert her back to the big label, which was universal. So we helped her develop her early career, and then they took her back. And uh, anyways, we saw some, some, uh, some revenue flow from that. And uh, I got to meet her once backstage. Uh, not that it matters, because she wouldn't know who the hell I was, and I didn't know who the hell she was at the time. It really didn't matter. That's also what you discover. Celebrities all BS. Um, I, I, I will, that's a hot nutter. If you have a beer with me one day, one of you guys, I'll tell you the stories because there's nothing that interesting, but um, they're just people. Um, so I did start my serious business, I guess, which was idea because Maple, I just helped with the technology side. Other people were running with it, but I helped build the technology architecture for the e-commerce server stuff and eventually the strategy around the digital services and Ideaca, we were another software firm that worked on supply chain solutions, somewhat similar to Omni, but different. It was acquired by Hitachi uh, in 2014. Um, we got it to, it was right around 600 million in revenue, not quite as big as Omni, and I uh, had another 300 staff. I was the full CEO of the company, and uh, we built it from scratch, but it was time for it to go when it got acquired. We had, we had venture capital investors, which were in it for 10 years, and they needed they need the money out. I did two couple other startups, Wreckage and Nelf, which uh, didn't make it. They, they died on the table, uh, which I don't need to go into. It's just software. It's worth, not worth a conversation right now. I got into executive coaching. So I started up a little executive coaching company on the side, and it still runs as my executive coaching. I, I do work with tech executives, um, and I, I just do essentially uh, personal executive coaching and, and business mentorship. Uh, I had another uh, side hustle called Cycles Tucson because I love building bikes. I also love working on cars. Um, people are wondering, I'm an air-cooled guy. So um, Volkswagens, uh, Corvairs, Porsches, but I'm selling them all off. I don't have time. I've lost interest. It's another story. Um, and then just recently, I started up a digital health 
design studio called Alto Sante. We work on digital health companies. Um, so I'm actually a fractional executive. So I, I, I uh, help them scale. In the side, uh, I was doing a bunch of other things. So I uh, Kai mentioned, I was an adjunct professor at Bizet School of Business. I taught one course a semester for six years in venture startups. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a LP and GP in several venture capital funds, which I'm winding myself out of those. I had this thing after I left uh, Hitachi and Ideaka that I might want to uh, be a venture capital dude. Uh, and that wasn't for me. I don't actually like the science of making money. I know it sounds stupid. Um, it's not that interesting for me. And a lot of the people are really, I know, uh, this one I don't have to worry about. There's some great people in venture capital. That's Evan, extreme. Yeah. I mean, just letting you know we're at 504. Okay. Students okay. have piled a giant list of questions. Oh my God. I should see that. Okay. You want to ask Go a few forward. questions now? I won't, you know what? I would say at the end of stuff, I'll answer some questions now that are germane. How's that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm going to go just backward and uh, let's see. There's a lot of interesting questions. And uh, first one is, I believe to create something amazing, you need to be able to work hard. How do you stay consistent with or maintain your passion throughout your career? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's little things, I think. So, uh, you know, I could go to some of the other points and that might help answer the question of what I did. I have some hacks. You know what? I'm going to go there now because I realize, yeah, I, go I ahead. you know what? I'm going to go there. I see some of the other questions uh, too that I'm hoping to <laughs> answer some of them through this. So look, um, there's a Harvard study. It's the people in your life that matters. It's your relationships that matter at the end of the day. It's not money. It's not your degrees. By the way, Degrees are greatly, I know I'm talking to university students, they're greatly overrated. You need a degree to get past that. You need that flag typically. But even today, a lot of companies, I'll hire people without degrees. You know, you drop out after first year. I'm going to look at who you are, what you've done. I'm going to have my staff, you know, because I'm not that good at coding anymore. I'm going to have them look at your stuff that you've got uh, in GitHub, blah, blah, blah. It's it's the relationships you've developed. So the big thing is, is um who do you basically hang out with? Who do you socialize? Who do you, where do you spend time? Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to go to my next point here. So I, I don't believe in the you know, actual karma that there's some kind of God with hands on the lever counting what you've done good and bad in your life. But I like the idea of things come back and pay off. So I'm going to tell you guys out there, a lot of shitty human beings out there, a lot of crooks, liars, cheats, psychopaths, right? Sociopaths, they're out there. Okay. And, and the world is full of them. There's some of them are very successful. I spent my entire career trying to avoid those guys and work with people that I actually like. So I have a little thing. I like to do good work with good people. Um, and how you work, do that is you got to be generous, right? You've got to be generous to your time. You should be grateful for what you have. I know that's a hard thing. I mean, I didn't come from a great life, but my father did teach me. You just can't resent all the shit that got piled on you because you can wallow in. You can just live. In. And I've watched people do that. Be resentful of all the things. I know it's easy to do. I, I, I've been there and you have to put that aside. So you need to be present for your friends, your family. First of all, you can't neglect them. And, and I've been, been with entrepreneurs who gave up all that to continue to do their thing. And they, in my opinion, destroyed their lives. They have money. They have the trappings. They have like five supercars and a private jet. And I can tell you this much. I had, I can, this may be my experience. I have yet to meet one that is really that happy. They're always trying to go for the next thing because they're looking for something they haven't found. Um, you know what? And if you have good friends, you can get help that you can, you can ask them. So you, you, it's reciprocal help, share all those things. And I got my ass bailed out so many times by friends that I'd made. I'm at two in the morning. I can't figure something out and I need help. And uh, now this is now in the modern age where you can actually text them and go text, are you up? <laughs> it's like, you know what? They know I'm going to do it the same, right? So that's really important. Um, but there are habits that I built as well, um, which I'll go to. So, okay, I would say be the person everyone wants to work with, okay? You're starting to realize, I'm going to talk about tech stuff in a bit, but this is all soft stuff, right? Um, so so, so don't be the asshole, okay? Um, and, you know, you know, ask yourself, you know, how, how am I the asshole kind of was... And, and, and for a lot of people in our industry, they have big egos and no one, you know, no one's that good. You're not that good. I'm not that good. 
you know, I, 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 uh, I've learned I'm not that good. And if you watch, you, you I, my co early code is embarrassing. I'm glad it's buried in debt. People look at my code and go, man, you were shit. I knew I was shit. I knew other people were better, uh, but I could always learn from them. So that was the other thing too, right? So um, I'll tell you, get good at one thing. You guys are earning your career and grow from there, okay? But you got to be skilled at it all, it's my opinion. Uh, as a software, you got to do design, you got to code, you got to document, you got to test debug, do it all. I got, I remember a lot of people had this attitude. I'm a dev, I'm a coder. I don't do this fucking shit testing. I don't debug other people's crap. Well, I don't document, I don't this, I don't that, I'm too good. Well, princess, suck it up, right? You got to be what we call the key-shaped individual, which Kyle will probably talk about. In other words, you're going to have some areas you can have deep skills in, and that's what you're known for, but you got to know them all. So you get this kind of wavy key-shaped thing going on of skills, and you, and you never stop because you got to keep learning the stuff. I've gone through like wave after wave after technology. I mean, we were talking about mainframes at the beginning. Uh, knowledge still is useful. You know, we had to do all kinds of crazy memory tricks to make it work, right? Um, because we had limited memory to, to get the, uh, to make our programs work. So um, one thing I've always seen with devs too, is that you, people have this weird pride that I've got to figure it out on my own, or that I'm smarter than everyone. I can build something better than everyone else. So instead of, you know, uh, you know, it's that, uh, that old adage, good artists steal, great artists deal with both hands. Well, I'm a big fan of open source and sharing code and taking code. And I won't get into piracy and stealing. <laughs> That's a whole other subject. And you could probably see which way I lean, but other people have done great work. You don't have to spend time. That's what the internet's for. Go and search this stuff out, find the snippets, talk to people, get out there, right? And, and you'll discover communities out there. And if you know what, if the first community doesn't accept you, find another one to find another. Rejection's okay. I've been rejected by a lot. Right, people go, Wow, you're too snooty to, to hang out with me. I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> What's wrong with you is my attitude, and you know, it's their loss. So, um, get out there. Um, the other thing as a technology person is, is don't be a fanatic. In other words, you'll meet people which are all about, Oh, Apple stack is the only way to go, and you program in Swift, or you know, Rust is the only environment for me, and Ruby on Rails is crap, and or Microsoft is this, or whatever. You know what? They're all technology. They're all basically essentially varying degrees, the same stuff. And if you actually follow the history, you go, wait a second, these all come from the same roots, right? Um, be open-minded to new and different and just be wary of the shiny and new. Um, and oh, be very wary of people who always have that answer, including me, by the way. So you can go and test whatever I have to say. I'm not telling you to take everything I have hook, line, and sinker here, right? Go and search and find out. And I'm not, I hate saying the word research nowadays because that just sounds like crazy shit in the internet now, right? But you kind of got to do your own work. Um, other thing for software devs, look, you guys are in software and there's two places you can go on my, I'm going to grossly oversimplify. You can create software that's software uh, for other software people. In other words, you're building the tools. You're building the actual database. You're building the actual code compiler. It's a very tiny, narrow world and more power to you, but it's not a very big place, right? And it requires extreme specialization. The mass majority of us, 90% of them are going to be building solutions for other people. So it's not about the tech, it's about the solution. That's why you need to learn, uh, you know, and have a broader mind. Um, okay, here's the hard part for many uh, software people. Um, the soft stuff is the hard stuff. So you got to grow all your soft skills. You got to get good at project management, even if you're not going to be a project manager. You got to have product management skills, even though you're not be a product manager. You got to have people skills, communications, writing reports, problem solving, conflict resolution. Um, the other last two things are really simple. You got to deliver. So you got to do what you told people you're going to get done, right? Uh, and that's a whole other subject of how we can get there. But I'm going to give you some simple things. Basically, under promise, over deliver, be honest, communicate. And you know what? If you can't get it done, you got to tell them. Hiding does not work. I can tell you, if you, most young people will do that. I did that, and it, it just burns you. Like if you and if you can't do it, tell them you can't. If you got a shitty boss who reams you up, then you should get find a new job at a different place. Not suck it up. Um, Try to accept new challenges. I have a lot of friends that said, you know what? I don't want the promotion. I don't want the responsibility. I'm telling you now, take them, right? Take them, right? So um, 
I uh, someone just saw about project management and CS degrees. You just fall into it if you're good at organizing. Most companies will recognize project managers that actually have CS backgrounds are in short supply. And they make the best project managers, in my opinion, because you actually know what's going on. Um, and, and companies that don't recognize, like I said, don't work there. And there's lots of bad companies, lots of bad companies. Um, so uh, that hopefully helps a little bit. Um, there's a bunch of stuff here that uh, uh, I talk about. So uh, one thing you guys recognize, soft skills stick right? They're enduring. Hard skills that you guys will learn, you'll laugh and you'll laugh like I do. Like my mainframe skills are laughable, 40 years old. Actually, there's still people programming mainframes. They, they charge 300 bucks an hour, by the way. It's a, it's a lost ancient art. It's like being able to read Egyptian hieroglyphics now, right? So I don't know how exciting it is to look at 40-year-old banking code at RBC that's written in mainframe crap, uh, but it's there. Um, but for the most of us, that stuff disappears. Languages come and go. Environments come and go. Your soft skills stick with you for the rest of your life. Um, so the only constant is constant change, okay? Um, the other thing is you have to look at failure as fertilizer. So that means you have to take chances. And when things go to shit, you got to... It's as easy for me to say. It's hard to do. Is Jesus... Kai saw me. I sigh a lot. I go... Okay, fuck, it's messed up again, right? Complete foobar. What do we do? Okay, then I plan my way out of it. And I've done this literally 100,000 times in my life because that's what happens. It comes with the territory. If you become an entrepreneur when you're running a company, when you're a team lead, whatever, right? Um, I'm just going to quickly say one here, uh, the the do uh, you do you, and I'll skip the rest for now. Um, don't measure yourself against others especially if you're a student. I mean, I had a moment of jealousy when I graduated university and a bunch of these guys went to the oil patch. I talked about that. I were making these massive bonuses. I mean, I remember guys walking in, uh, you know, where we're at the pub, they're coming in and they just pulled up in their new Porsche, 24 years old. And this is 1980s when that wasn't very common. It'd be like pulling up today at age 24 in a new Lambo, okay, Lamborghini and basically flexing and going, oh, fuck. You know, and I was sort of like, oh, you know, why me? Woe is me. Look at him. Well, three years later, his car got repoed because his career was a, it was based on a bunch of smoke. Not to say that he couldn't have sustained it. And, and the thing was, that's not the point. The point is don't measure yourself again. And just just forgive yourself for, you know, the things that you maybe you've done wrong. and Don't judge others and do what you need to do. Right. Um, so uh, maybe we could go to the questions again, Kai, because uh, I don't want to run out of time here. Okay, so I'm going to ask some questions and I promise we're not going to get through all the questions, but <clears throat> what I can promise students is I'm going to share the questions with Evan and uh, and I'm going to needle him to answer some of it when we run out of time because there's a lot of good questions here. Um, several students have asked the question, I think you're mentioning of you having a B average really struck a chord. And we are very, you and I are very aligned on how we see grades. So, so the question is, how did you get past your B average? Was it sheer determination? You had B average. How did you get past difficult subjects in engineering? What's your advice for people that's struggling with really abstract things they have to learn? And, and really from my perspective, I would just like you to talk from your perspective, you're a you're hiring a new CS grad. How do you look at their grades? I actually am suspicious of straight A 4.0 GPAs because um, I find that they tend to be very good at the book learning and doing that kind of work, but they struggle with perfection. I Perfect is the enemy of the good. I got it on my slide. They can't let that go. And when you get into industry, uh, our attitude is get what it takes to get the job done. So slap it in and move on because you've got a lot to do here and good enough is good enough. Um, so I don't look in my companies. We never look at like uh, we look at 4.0 GPA and this scholarship and that scholarship. That's great. So what? That doesn't really much to us. I'm interested in you. So and, you know, the interview is important. And we don't do long interviews, by the way. Um, I find references. Um, and this is why networking, like the vast majority of people come to the companies I've worked with. And I, I think I've hired probably over 3000 people over the years, uh, mainly it's basically directly into the companies. Cause I used to always interview the last interview. We, we tended to do three interviews in my companies. 
um, half hour though, right? So we didn't like wasting people's time. Um, so I was looking for what you did in the outside, to be honest. And I was looking at um, what kind of other sort of soft skills you had to deal with. Like, if you didn't know what to do, what did you do, right? Um, how did you, can you research stuff on your, how much independence did you have? Can you show that to me? So you have to have something in your background. And I, I could tell you, I just hired a bunch of people recently in Calgary for one of the startups because the startups didn't have much money. So we couldn't afford actually to get CS grads. CS grads wanted 80, 90,000 a year. And we only had with our grant money, 50,000 a year. So I found a bunch of C students at, at a business school. And, and these guys were great kids. They, they uh, came from uh, tough family backgrounds. They all had worked, like they literally working in fast food through university. Um, and, but they had okay grades. They're like B students, which I knew that that means you're okay. They had these hard jobs. I went, how many hours a week are you working? 35 hours plus a full school schedule. That impressed me because I knew they had endurance, right? And I just said, I can, tr we were going to train them. So we expected that if you show up, you got to show up every day for us. We're not going to abuse that relationship, but you're going to have to be able to do the work and, 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 and learn your way into position. And most good places will do that. The problem is it's hard to find places that are like that. So uh, I, there's a bit of that. So what, what practical tip is, you know what, um, you have to have a nice presenting resume that's very simple. You've got to have stuff that shows that you have the ability to stick with things. So, you know, um, you know, the retail position can help. If you said I've been the same retailer for two years and you said, you know, you're top salesperson or whatever, sales skills are hard to find. You're reliable, dependable, but you have, have if a coding profile, like, like in your in your portfolio, show some projects that you did, you create a project, volunteer somewhere, build something for a not for not a uh, not for profit, build an app that actually works. That's more than enough to get you on that first rung. I call it getting on the first rung of the ladder. If you can do that, it's really important. Um, I, I know that's way too glib and shallow, but um, we've got limited time. I'm, I'm happy to come back another day too, or do a separate session off hours. I, I don't mind. I, I think just so you know, students like you very much. A lot of students are asking you to come back, which <laughs> is what I was expecting because I was banking on people liking you and uh, kind of using you as a way to motivate students <laughs> to come to class. Um, yeah, my e my ego is blowing up now, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me, uh, let me, okay, so you can, you can see in chat, students are really saying, please come back. I think, I think the, uh, the, 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 the really relatability and honesty is great, right? It's not the typical academic conversation. So I do want to get into a couple, quote unquote, more academic key thing. Okay. If you knew you were going to be an entrepreneur, how would you change your university path? I guess there's also a question of uh, university path. Yeah, I mean, I had no idea I was going to do it. I was taking a head down, get a good corporate job back. This is the 80s. You got to remember, right? There were no there were no role models for this, really. People like myself, I never thought I could be that. So I didn't think I had permission to be that. So it really didn't matter at the time. So now that I know what I know, um, I, I would say, you know, back to that key shape thing, uh, you've got to, you've got to be good. You've got to be decent at everything, which sounds completely crazy. Okay. So you got to have a little bit of accounting background. You should understand basic HR. You need to understand, like I, I mentioned conflict management, like read a book, take a YouTube course, uh, you know, a couple, you know, there are good YouTube lectures on conflict management, right? You know, how to develop, develop sales skills, right? It's, it's all those little skills. Um, and by the way, there's crazy things that none of your CS people will ever tell you. The hardest people to find in the industry, for example, in software are software salespeople. And they get paid the most, by the way. If you're if you're, if you're extrinsically motivated by the giant carrot, let me tell you, my sales guys and my companies back in the day were the highest paid, not to my devs, and they used to drive my devs nuts. And I go, guys, you want to make that kind of dough? You can join my sales group. And they go, I don't know how to do it. Well, I said, I'll help you, right? But here's the thing. Look up, just look up sales techniques. Look up how to sell. There are all, you, the one thing you guys have going for you, it's all there in the internet. It's all there. Uh, and look for books and stuff like that. So while you're in university, I would say don't go, okay, so some people are going to shoot me. And again, this is my point of view. So it's pure opinion. 
don't get super specialized in university courses that are super technical. You'll never use most of it. Most of the stuff you'll figure out on the job. So um, take as many broad courses, take a couple business courses, take a basic accounting course. Seriously, take a basic accounting course. I wish I'd done that, right? Um, I did. I ended up doing something. I, I took an MBA course into my master's degree because I realized how important basic accounting knowledge was, right? Um, it's, it's the fundamental basis of all business and, and, and engineers don't take it. Computer science students don't generally take accounting courses, right? Um, Take stuff that interests you too, right? Um, it doesn't always have to be because um, you get insights back to the discovery skills. You need a little bit of a break. You, you can't be constantly putting pressure. And I think I saw something, you know what? I'll be honest. I know it sounds crazy because people look at me going, hey, I mean, you never stop moving. And I said, I'm not the hardest working guy in that traditional sense, okay? Um, the reason why I was a crap student is I couldn't study for more than half an hour at a time. I'd get bored and I'd wander off if a friend came by and said, hey, we're going off to watch a football game on the TV and drink beers at the student pub, guess where I went off to? I went off there and didn't do my homework. I had three of the four assignment questions done. I'd say, screw the fourth question, right? I gave up on the marks. You know what? In the grand scheme of things, I'm not encouraging you to be delinquent, but it doesn't, that, that, that the, uh, the uh, incremental value of that extra work isn't worth anything. The socializing with my friends actually was more important for my mental health and for friendship building. Hey, so yeah. I do have to interrupt him once in a while because he will go on and on. I, I want to cover a couple of quick questions. Uh, what's your tip for networking and for career? Do you yeah. prioritize networking over expertise? How do you position that expertise versus networking? Okay. Uh, so don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't I don't value expertise. Of course, I value expertise. When I need somebody who can do this piece of work, I absolutely need them. I need the best. I'll find that person, right? So I have absolute respect for deep technical skills. The thing in the great greater world, there is not that much need for super deep technical skills. And the, and the danger of having deep technical skills is it's all about timing. You know, when, when there's only five people that are really good at this and eight people are needed, you, you command the price, you know, supply demand. When the economy collapses and the, the, the need for your deep technical experience isn't there, you, you, will, you won't get work for two years, right? If you're that deep. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the soft skills uh, are something that are always needed, right? So, so can, can you reframe that question? Because I kind of lost, I got the deep technical skills because I, I think they're important. I, right? I, I, th I think you're addressing it, right? And I, yeah, I think the yeah. point Stephen wanted to know is network versus expertise which is more important yeah and so and, it, and I, I i can add also versus you know career and hobby right like what how do they balance their time because i know a lot of students have this kind of how, how what do i do with my life yeah time wise you know i i have the hacks on the next slide real quick there's a couple of them there i always say always have so this is a networking thing always have 10 minutes for someone People, that's a networking thing. In other words, someone asks for you to help them for 10 minutes, ask for your opinion. You'd be surprised how many people are complete dicks about this and they'll just blow you off. You're too, you're too low. You're nobody. I'll always give someone, I don't care who they are. I don't have this, um, you know, I'm too high above and mighty and I can't spend 10 minutes and some poor kid asks me a question. And I go, you know, kid, you could have looked it up, but I'll give them the answer. And I'm not going to rub their face in it. I don't want to be a dick. Because here's the crazy part. This is back to karma. Little kids grow into big people. Trust me, I have a lot of guys that work with me who are way past me now, right? And it's not because I'm afraid of them. I actually are their friends, which is kind of weird because like I, they were my like students and now they're my friends drinking beers with me, running their own companies. 20 years later, they're middle-aged guys now, right? Okay, so having that 10 minutes and I learn something from every conversation, so will you get in their shoes and say, okay, what's the question they're asking? Why are they asking it, right? Maybe the question's easy to answer, but you're kind of wondering like, why didn't you think of this? You know, anyways, it's an opportunity for you to learn. So that's one. Uh, the easy one, by the way, living in GTA, this is a tough one, but commuting is a waste of time. So if you can figure out, I'm not saying it's easy to live as close to your work or work from home or work from anywhere, which is, you guys are lucky this may be changing now in, in your lifespan. But my, so many of my friends would go, man, I want to get married, have a kid, and we want to move up to Markham, right? Or Newmarket. 
right? And I'm going, New Market, you work on fucking Bay Street. Are you crazy? Right? The commute is an hour and a half each way. Think about three hours a day that could be used for something else. Um, so that gets into curating your leisure time. Okay, so here's something interesting too, because um, like I said, I'm not I'm not a workaholic. People think that I'm a workaholic because I seem to be on all the time. I'm happily, I'm, I could happily right now shut this machine off right now and, and go play a video game for all you guys know, right? And just if you're ever wondering what video games do I play? Uh, I like to play old RTSs like Age of Empires, but I also play Dota very badly because my sons play Dota and they humiliate me and I play more Thunder. So I do play other, do other things. I play musical instruments. I curate my leisure time though. That's a little anal sounding, uh, but I think about where I spend my leisure time because I know I need to have things I do for fun. So that's how I keep in touch with my sons. We actually watch movies together online and critique and, you know, we have a little family book club now. Um, and I keep in touch with my ex-wife. I have a good relationship with my ex-wife because I, they're, my ex-wife's the mother of three of my sons. I remarried another one. So I had to think about these things and it sounds a little cold blooded, but I guess I'm super pragmatic about these things. Um, so, and I don't golf. Golf takes up five hours. All right. I play beer league hockey because I love playing hockey and I get to hang out with people at the same time. I do, I'm not a fan. So you know what? I love professional sports. I could watch professional sports all day. I know it's a waste of my time. Like who cares who won the Stanley Cup in 1992 and who got the Conn Smythe trophy, you know, who won the Super Bowl and blah, blah, blah. And how many yards of passing did he throw for that year? I used to have all that shit in my head. I still love that shit, but it's not a good use of my time. So if I'm going to do something, that's why I play beer league hockey. I don't follow the NHL a whole lot. I'm a participant. And here's something around, this is the bookend to the 10 minutes for someone. Just every once in a while, you know, if there's a friend that you haven't reached out, just give them a call. Old-fashioned school or drop them an email or something. Say, hey, how are you doing? Have a break bread with them, right? So, okay. Hit me with another one if we've got time. Oh, we're past time. We are at the end of class. I uh, I just want to mention there is uh, uh, we are going to bring you back just based on how many people have requested. Um, so we're going to and, and I think folks are <laughs> wanting to stay longer to talk to you, which <coughs> I'm I'm quite OK with. And, you know, if all my professors were this cool, I wouldn't fail course. So the, you're, you're getting a lot of <laughs> sort of confidence here. I have I have age on my side, given how old I am now, and I could definitely tell you there are people you're going to run across and said that Evan was a total asshole, and I can tell you twenty year old Evan <coughs> has a lot of asshole moments. You could talk to a few old ex girlfriends who can find them and go, oh, what a dick he was. You know what I was okay, so I had to learn too, right? I had to unlearn a bunch of other shit. So one thing I got the benefit from is I had a very good mentor said, you know what, he told me. You got to forgive yourself at some point in time, dude, because I used to be the hardest critic. Like I used to feel so guilty about being shitty up to someone when I was shitty because I had a temper. I have a real temper, which I bet I took anger management. That's why things can be dealt with. You didn't want to know younger me sometimes. And I learned that, hey, you know what? Yelling at people doesn't make things better. Right. Um, so I got my own. I have one. I have yeah. one last comment, but unfortunately, I'm going to be the. And I don't like being this, right? Because Evan and I would talk for hours and hours. And uh, but uh, no. <laughs> I want to respect everybody's time. I just, it just this one comment is so funny. I want to share with you is that there, several students have requested you to start a podcast. <laughs> and I mentioned to them, <laughs> we'll try to start one. It didn't work out. <clears throat> but yeah, now you know there is a uh, there is a. Ah. There is obviously a audience for this. So. Uh, this, this is, yeah, Kai, it's Lean maybe Startup we gotta one. You know, maybe we need to revisit. But okay. for now, I just want to say thank you so much, Evan, for joining us and for sharing your uh, your perspectives. And uh, and I think uh, I think we'll definitely bring you back for uh, for uh, probably sometime next semester. We'll figure out a time. And I'll prioritize. Uh, prioritize. Hey, you know what? I've always got time for you and your students, so uh, we'll figure something out. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this little journey of yours. So. <coughs> Thank you I'm so good. much, Evan. 
All right. All right, everybody, uh, just before you leave, just a reminder, we're going to have reflection posted to, uh, to probably tomorrow. I need to talk to Evan about what reflection questions we'll give you, and that's that, right? So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Evan, and uh, I think Evan might have popped up. So take care, everybody.